All right, we'll go ahead and get started. It's 3.30. And so uh, welcome to AEAPD Online Live. Uh, today we have Adam Vori and Nancy Mobil uh, really to talk about introducing us to standards-based grading uh, and especially in the area of social studies and uh, some of the impact that Adam's been able to see as he's been implementing this over the past year. Um, if you've used Adobe Pro Connect before, uh, you'll notice that over on the side there is an attendee list. Um, so you can see who is here. At the bottom there's a chat box where several of you have been introducing yourselves. As you have questions, go ahead and type those in and we'll try and weave those in as uh, Nancy and Adam are sharing their story with us. Um, also, if you're having trouble hearing or you have a question, uh, you'll notice across the top there's uh, looks like a little icon of a person with their hand raised. Uh, that is, will open up a drop down menu where you can raise your hand or send us a message to talk up or talk softer. So uh, go ahead and use those icons over on the side uh, to let us know if you're having trouble difficulty. And with that, I will turn it over to Nancy and Adam. Thanks, Rob. So uh, thank you again for all of you for being here. Um, we do think in talking across the state, there is quite a bit of interest, interest in standards-based grading. And as I'm meeting with the social studies group, there's some particular interest because they've sort of been out of any direct connect in a, a lot of instances with um, specific training just for social studies. So what I'd like to do is have Adam introduce himself and tell us a little bit about his educational journey and how he kind of got to this point. And again, just as a reminder, if any of you have a question during any of this um, session, this is really for all of us to learn and, and think about. Or if you even have a resource to share, we'd appreciate hearing that. So with that, Adam, if you could um, kind of just give us your background and let us know how you yeah. got started. <clears throat> I'm Adam Vori. I am the 6th through 12th grade social studies teacher and computers teacher here at Northeast Hamilton in Blairsburg, Iowa. I graduated from UNI in 2009 and I started student teaching and I was only there for about three weeks when I decided I had uh, no idea what I was doing and I decided that I really did not like uh, what I knew about teaching and I just did not feel like what I was doing was very effective. Um, you come into school in the morning and you watch students uh, passing your assignments around and just copying each other's answers down and you start to ask yourself uh, what did I really teach and what do the students really know? And I started asking myself what I would do differently than what I was watching my cooperating teacher do and it was a doing the same thing just in a different way so after that I decided that I really am not prepared to uh, do this for my career and do it effectively so I left and after a couple months I decided that I needed to just take some time off and I took a full-time job uh, at a place that I did not have to think a whole lot so I could spend my time during the day thinking about education. And I did that for about three years. And over the course of that three years, in my free time, I would read up on what education should be and really think about what my philosophy on education should be and make sure that my instruction is matching that and trying to figure out ways on how I would do that. And what I came up with was um, I decided that I preferred standards-based grading instead of the points-based system that has really been around for a while. Um, it just solved some of the problems that I was having with education. And as I said, after three years, I went back and finished my student teaching. And I've been here in my first year at Northeast Hamilton, and I think it's going well. And... Uh, as we go on, I'll explain a little bit more about kind of my thinking and how I came up with what I did. So Adam, when you were um, during that three years of additional prep and thinking about teaching, who were some of the um, lead researchers or um, just thought leaders that you 
paid attention to and that you dug into as far as so who informed you of this um, work? The main influence on my work was uh, Dr. Marzano. When I decided that I would rather grade based on a standard than on a random task that I had happened to assign the students, uh, I could not figure out how to make it work because the school system, um, the majority of the school systems are still based off of and built around giving out points. And so I needed something that I could start with as a base that I could actually adapt to a points-based system and he came up with a plan um, that I was able to actually take and adapt. Um, and a second person I would have to give credit to would be Carol Ann Tomlinson. She did a, or is doing, a great deal of work with differentiation and that was something that was very important to me and grading using standards allows me to do that much, much easier than any points-based system that I have seen. Great, thank you. Um, what, uh, when I look at, I'm gonna share a, there, and thank you, Leslie, she shared the book. And I'm gonna also share a site from Solon, who has been, uh, Solon Community Schools in Iowa. They've been probably the lead that I'm aware of, the lead school as a district who's gone to um, standards-based grading. When you take a look at the link that I show, it shows the um, difference between traditional grading and standards-based grading. And Adam, if I can have you just take a quick look at that and comment on, when I look at that, I think, wow, there's some uh, significant changes in philosophy and even understanding um, between the two of, of traditional grading versus standards-based. And I'm wondering what you did uh, to prepare your students for um, thinking differently about what a grade was and, and how they would um, proceed through your class. Sure. Uh, just looking through that right now. And actually a lot of that is a very, very nice way of putting it and a great deal of that is exactly what I told my students. Um, the first day that I had them in here, I uh, talked about what standards-based grading was going to be like, and I laid out all the advantages for them. I don't care um, so much about the task that gets you there. What the important thing is, is that you learn whatever that goal is, uh, whatever that standard that I have set up for you. Um, if you are able to do it faster, why should I waste your time? Uh, why should I give you extra homework just so you can get points in the book if you already know it? So there are some advantages that were really attractive to the students that way. And the other thing I said was, why should you be punished in the learning phase if you don't understand something yet? You know, if I give a student assignment, uh, the way I used to do things, if I gave them an assignment and they got it wrong, you know, it was wrong and it went in the grade book and you could possibly, potentially, dig yourself a hole where if you prove to me later on down the road that you understand that, you still have that mark against you. What I'm doing right now is the only grades that go in the grade book for content are the test itself and so they have up to that time to work on things and prove to me beyond a doubt that they actually understand what that is. And I take that information, that feedback that I get from their assessments, and I model, or I modify my teaching uh, and my lesson plans based on that. I think that if you truly value formative assessment and want to take that feedback and actually use it, uh, it should not count against that student and you should be constantly assessing those students on what they understand and what they don't so that you can change your instruction based on student needs. And if I can ask, how long of a um, transition time did that take for the students to really understand that they didn't have to do homework if they chose not to, but it may behoove them to do that? Um, talked about what the student's response was to any of that. Um, as a whole, and then maybe if you have any highlights of particular uh, students. Well, right now, I do want to clarify that there is required homework. It's not always um, optional. 
or it's it's never optional if they don't understand something they do have to do that homework it's those students who are excelling above and beyond that uh, if they can come to me and tell me and talk to me and I they can prove to me that they understand it, then that would be how you do that at homework uh, or that extra assignment. Uh, but back to the first part of your question uh, regarding how long it took students to adjust. It was a good month or so, probably a month and a half, before I stopped hearing how many points is this worth, uh, that kind of thing, before they really got into uh, the idea that what's important is that they know and understand the information and not that they completed this task that they looked up in a book and they found the right answer and they put it down and here give me some points. Uh, that's not the way it works in here. They have to know it and understand it and show it to me in class that they understand it and then we can move on. Great. Uh, Janet has a question kind of regarding we were talking about what it took to educate the students, but her question is, how about the parents? What, um, what have you come across with educating parents and helping them understand uh, this sure. whole transition? I uh, talked to my administration about that right away before uh, uh, wanting to know if I should send out a letter or anything like that. And they said, no, no, that's fine. What I've been doing is explaining it to the parents as we see them. And actually, we have parent-teacher conferences coming up in a couple weeks, so if they have any questions, um, they'll come up then. As far as actually sending something out and explaining it to them that I am doing this, we have not done that here. And you have, I know in Solon, I've, I've listened to Matt Townsley before, and he has, um, he's very forthright in saying that some of the parents were concerned, but so you're fortunate. I, you know, I also think, uh, how many of your um, peers or your your faculty are working on standards based uh, grading. I am the only one right now. Okay, so they, um, it'll be interesting to hear from you after uh, parent teacher yeah. conferences. The uh, kind of agreement we put in place was I would be kind of a test uh, or ex experiment and we'll see how it goes in here and possibly going forward with the school district um, depending on how things go it could be adopted in the school district across the board so very good um, there's comments in the uh, chat pod Leslie has some information. I know, Leslie, you have to go um, because of a conflict, but so you have some um, resource to sh resources to share um, who want to be starting with um, standards-based grading, and then she has some rubrics as well for some units. And then, um, Leslie, where is Ashley Davis from? Oh, she, she is actually is Ashley with um, us a fellow teacher of mine here, she teaches English, and she asked me oh, about okay. it. Uh, my superintendent kind of put me on the spot during a uh, meeting one day and asked me to share uh, what I was doing uh, because initially only the superintendent and myself and the principal knew that I was doing this and during a staff development day he asked me to share what I was doing and I did have one other uh, teacher, co-worker, that was Ashley Davis, who has started looking into it. Um, she's starting on a book right now. So when I think about you um, working on this, how much effort did it take for you to really dig in? I know you participated, um, for those in the audience who are not familiar with the Big History Project, which is um, from uh, funded by Bill Gates himself, and it is a social studies online course but it has a lot of science to it. I know you participated in the training mm -hmm. through the Gates Foundation and then you did standards-based grading. What kind of a process was that? It is, uh, it was a long difficult process to say the least. Uh, trying to figure out um, how do I do this and make sure that students are uh, actually doing the work to make sure they get it done. And then 
digging, really digging through the content and figuring out what is worthy of actually being a standard. What is something that I do want to make sure that my students know next year and five years from now and for the rest of their life? And really cutting out and uh, eliminating some of that stuff that I kind of call trivia. Um, something that I could uh, Google real quickly and find an answer um, and that could be put on a test. I'm really not interested in so much as them actually finding information and using it. So it's figuring out how to uh, write standards in that way where I'm really getting to the deeper, tougher questions. And that's why we have the two different levels that we do in that standards rubric. And for the audience, I know a lot of us like to get into the samples. We really thought we would um, address that in more detail in webinar two. We were thinking a half an hour is a good time for teachers. Um, so in the interest of time, that's um, we'll, we'll be digging into that next time. So um, Leslie had to go, but she did share quite a few resources. So thank you, Leslie. I also did share the um, Big History Project. Um, link and if you're not familiar with it it's worth worth taking a look at an integrated unit and um, it's free so certainly uh, kind of a new I would say a new um, format for teaching social studies so I at this point I'd like to kind of open this up to the group to see if there's um, specific questions for you uh, one comment that I'd like to make though is that um, particularly at AEA PD Online, we have a community site called Agora, and we think that it's a great way for people to, to across Iowa to um, come together, maybe in job-alike groups. So, and thinking that if Adam's doing this work, there's several others of you doing this work, um, and how much better off we'd be able to um, move forward if we could share in that effort. So. Um, with that, you'll be hearing more about kind of where we're, we're headed with this. But um, back to our conversation with Adam, and Janet has a question, mm -hmm. Adam, if you want to look um, here. Uh, talking about the amount of time that standards-based grading took, and do I think it's a first-year implementation thing? Uh, I'll start with the first part of that question. The writing of the rubrics uh, I think will largely be a first year thing. As I go forward, I will be re-examining them and making sure that that is really the content that I should be assessing. I know several of my earlier brackets I'm not very, or rubrics, excuse me, I'm not very pleased with and I would like to go over those again and re redo those. Um, as far as other aspects of standards-based grading that take a lot of time, I do all of it on Google Docs, and it takes some time to update it. And it definitely takes more time than writing a number in a grade book. But I think it is valuable as far as getting students that feedback. Because how I'm doing it, which is something we're getting more into in the next one in a couple weeks, but all those students have that rubric shared with them individually on a Google Doc. And as I grade their assessments, I highlight it green if they are good and they have proven to me that they understand that learning goal, and I highlight it red if they need to continue to work with me on that learning goal. Because they know that if they get to the end of the week and they have not proven to me that they understand that, that's how they wind up with some weekend homework, which is the big classroom management thing that I use to hold over their heads. Not so much that you're going to lose points, but you're going to wind up with some extra homework on the weekend if you do not work at this and prove to me that you understand this. So as far as keeping up that kind of book work, it takes quite a bit of time that will be going forward, um, at least in compared to writing a number in a grade book. <clears throat> So Adam, I have a quick question, and then we'll go to Heather's question in the chat box. Uh, my question is, how um, personalized does your classroom become 
as people are at different stages of their um, meeting the standard. And, and then I guess this kind of goes along with Heather's, what does any reassessment or even relearning look like? Um, if, you know, where, where are they getting additional materials if they didn't get it right the first time or, or sure. what does that look like? Uh, I will start with the additional materials aspect of that. Uh, again, with Google Docs, I have, well, aside from the textbook and any activities that we do in class, I share on Google Doc a file with all six classes called Supplemental Materials, where I'm going out and I'm finding other things um, to give to that student, to share with that student that might help them understand that learning goal. And again, I want to make sure I emphasize this. I don't care that they can complete a task, and I don't, compl I don't care how they learn the information. What's important to me, and I think what's important to everybody as teachers, is that the student does learn the information, not so much how. So as far as extra materials, I do that. I also have a number of books and other things available to them, aside from just the computer lab and the internet. Uh, lots of this information they could learn by getting on Google, getting on YouTube, and doing some searching for themselves and learning about it on their own. And I think that's attractive to some students that uh, if the assignment itself doesn't matter and they have a very good way that has worked for them in the past to actually learn material, then they can go with that and run with that, and that's fine, that's great, that works for them because they're only going to be assessed on whether or not they know the material. <clears throat> so uh, kind of as a follow-up would be Heather's question in the chat box, what do reassessments mm -hmm. look like? And then do students have to do correctives mm -hmm. before reassessing? Um, there is no multiple choice in my class, no true, false. All kinds or every assessment I have is either short answer or talking to me. So it's not something that they can look up in a book or Google and find the right answer and put it down on a piece of paper and hand it to me and say, here you go. Uh, that was actually a battle that I fought quite a bit early on is I would have students uh, find the right answer and give it to me and say, okay, am I good now? And I'd just take the paper and put it behind my back and ask the student the question. They say, well, uh, I don't know, it's on the paper. And I say, well, I don't care. The whole point of doing this was so that I know that you understand this learning goal. And so that was an adjustment which the students have pretty much worked towards eliminating. And uh, <clears throat> as far as corrections and things that they have to do before they can retake some kind of assessment, um, I ask that they sit down with me and we talk through the materials so that I can kind of get a better sense of what is it that I'm doing or they're doing that isn't working for them, what is it that they don't understand, what things do work for them that maybe I could tie in or look for to give them so that they are more successful in the future. And then because the test isn't multiple choice or not true false, there's nothing that they can guess on, it's all short answer they get to retake that test again. And it is, <clears throat> um, excuse me, it is the same word for word actually test. And I don't care how long it takes them to uh, learn that material. What I care is that they learn it. Why should a date on a calendar uh, dictate when a student is able to learn information? So, Adam, in response to that, how how do you keep your timeline, kind of a time frame, you know, a, as learning becomes the constant and time is the variable, do you see your class um, kind of moving further and further apart in where they're at on any spectrum of learning uh, along their learning yeah. goals? Uh, what I should address are, because this was a big struggle of mine when I was in my little three-year journey trying to figure out what I was going to do, what do you do with those students who are very advanced and are able to move ahead? And that is where Carol Ann Tomlinson actually 
uh, helped me out with that answer. There is this thing called compacting. If uh, you're not familiar with that, I can break that down for you real quickly. What you do is you offer the final test to for a unit or a chapter or however you break down uh, your time teaching. You offer that test to that student and they take it and if they do extremely well and they don't need to or they have proven that you already they already understand all the standards for that unit why should they sit in my classroom uh, if they already know the information so what I do is I allow them to learn about something that they want to learn about and I come up with a plan with that student and if it's a different subject area with that other teacher I have four eighth graders taking advantage of this right now and one sophomore uh, who are taking advantage of it right now and they get to learn about something that they want to learn about that excites them. They have met my requirements. They have proven to me that they understand what I have asked them to understand. So now they have the opportunity to create their own learning and learn about something that they're passionate about. And as far as the lower end students, oh, Great. Sorry, so, as far as the okay. lower end students, it is a great deal of one-on-one -on -one time with me. They all, like I said, have that rubric that shows what uh, they understand and what they don't understand yet. And so it's sitting down with me and not looking over uh, individualized worksheets or any other kind of assignment, but we are really sitting down and digging into what is it that you don't understand about this learning goal. And so uh, we've had some really good conversations so far about those kinds of things. So in the chat box, there's some conversation going on about, um, are you concerned about the kids not having experience with multiple guests, <laughs> um, which is on standardized test. And then Keith brings up his point about men do better. You know, there is some test bias. And so have you thought through any of those? So I'll give you just a minute to read through those comments and see how you might reflect on those. And then... Um, given our time, we may need to um, shut down and then we'll resume this conversation and we sure appreciate everybody being here. We'll resume it on the 6th and then you'll actually show examples and I believe you're also very willing to share what you've done thus far. So you'll be sharing those rubrics. So with that, Adam, I'll back to you about kind of this whole test um, assessment performance right. Question. I will start with that first question there. Are you concerned about students not having experience with multiple guests taking standardized tests? Uh, they are getting that, in my case right now, they're getting that in their other classes. So they are having some kind of experience with it. It would just depend on going forward uh, if the school were to completely go that way. Um, is that a valuable enough skill, I guess, is what I would call it, or is that more valuable than um, what we're trying to do with standards-based grading, or is there another way we could teach them that that is not going to affect what we're trying to do with standards-based grading? How I would answer that one. reassessment part of standards-based grading should be part of the RTI implementation. I guess I'm not 100% sure what that question is referring to. Do, are you involved in response to intervention? Uh, not here, no. Or maybe not in the formal way. So kind of, I think districts are maybe I at know kind a of very all different. Small um, amount about it. Um, I think what I'm doing that would tie in best to that is all of these rubrics are also shared with each of those individualized students, um, special needs teachers and associates, so that they know what uh, learning goals their students that they're working with also need to work on. So if they have strategies that have been working for them within their room that they can implement and just take my learning goals and adapt it to them, they are able to do that. 
And I and Janet made the comment that she, I think she's just affirming that, yeah, what you do sounds like the, uh, an art, you know, your response to intervention. So very good. We did not get to Keith's comment, which I find interesting. And so we may pick that back up um, at our November 6th um, conversation. And at that time, Adam will also be sharing his specific rubrics. And then I think he's willing to have um, you all have access to them. And with our thought is that um, together we could probably even do get further along if you see that they match some of the work that you're doing. Um, that's an awful lot of work for one person. Uh, we think we can do it better together and um, that's kind of our hope. So with that, thanks so much for being here. Adam, we can't thank you enough for um, being willing to put mm -hmm. yourself out there. So um, have a good evening, everyone, and thanks for being here and we hope you will be back on thank the you. 6th.